Have you ever watched a math instructor and thought, they must be making this stuff up? Well, if you don't hit pause, you may get that feeling again real soon. Now in the previous lesson, we talked about this expression, n equals q times m plus r. And we talked about how if you have unique integer values, all four of those variables are integers, if you have unique integer values for n and for m, then there's exactly one solution for q and r where q is restricted, excuse me, where r is restricted to the range, it's got to be greater than or equal to zero and less than m. So, because if r gets to m, then you can add one to q, right? And then bring r back down into the range. Now, one of the things that we showed was if r is equal to zero, these are special cases. And what this means is, is when r is equal to zero, then m divides n. And this is going to be really important when we start talking about factorizing these numbers. Any sort of factorization is really important in math, and it's actually really important in computing, too. Now, one of the things that we're going to talk about for this is that if we are looking at r equals zero, and if the only values for m that satisfy m divides n are m equals n or m equals 1, then n is a prime number. It means you can't factor it by anything. You can't, make, you can't reduce it down with factorization. It can only be divisible by itself or by 1. Well, there are a couple of things that are really important when it comes to prime numbers. For example, in computing, encryption keys, that's the only, the encryption keys, modern encryption keys are based on very, very large prime numbers. And so an understanding of prime numbers and how they work and how we calculate them is pretty important when it comes to computing. Now, before we get to that, though, we're going to talk about a couple of properties of divisibility. So this thing where something divides another thing is divisibility. So properties of divisibility. Now, there are a couple of them that I want to talk about. The first one is that if A divides B and A divides C, if it A divides, if A goes into both B and C, then A also divides the sum of B and C. Let's do this with an example. If A is equal to 5, B is equal to 35, and C is equal to 25, and hopefully you've been around integers long enough to know that if an integer ends in 5 or 0, it is divisible by 5. Well, what we're saying here in this property right here is that 5 divides 35 plus 25, which is 60, and it does. 5 goes into 60 12 times. Turns out the same is true for subtraction. If we've got a divides b and a divides c, and as a side note, and b is greater than c, then a divides b minus c. Will it work with our variables up here? Well, yes, let's see. 5 divides b, 35, minus c, 25, 10. Yes, 5 does go into 10 twice, all right? Now, there are a couple other properties that I want to talk about, and these are really important whenever it comes to this idea of factorization. We'll show that in a minute. If a divides b or a divides c, then a divides b times c. How does this work? Well, let's first off show that, let's just pick one of these. Let's say that a does not divide c, but it does divide b. That means that there is some integer x that a times x equals b. Well, if a times x equals b, then over here what we've got is the b times c, we've got a times x times c, 
and you'll see that three integers, a, x, and c, the product are, the product of those three integers makes up b times c. And you'll see that a is a component of that. So in fact, a does divide into b times c. Understand, these are not proofs. I'm just giving you examples to show you how these properties work. One last one. If a divides b and b divides c, then a divides c. Wow, almost like A is getting passed along here, doesn't it? And it is, it's being passed along. If we were to look at this uh, by doing the same thing, let's see, if A divides B, that means there is some X that A times X equals B. And if B divides C, that means there is some Y where B times Y is equal to um, is equal to C. Well, if B times Y is equal to C, we just substitute A times X for B. We get A times X times Y, and that is equal to C. And now we see that the product of A, X, and Y, those three are going to give us C, which means that A is, in fact, a, a, one, of the, one of the factors of C. In other words, A divides C. So that is all true. The complexity of, co of computing a prime number is a topic of conversation around a lot of computing classes, a lot of computing theory classes. But let's just do some really basic things now. First of all, we're, what we're going to do is we're going to say, is a number P prime? How do we figure this out? So what we're looking at here is, there, is are there integers M and K that we can multiply together in order to get P. And if there are, if there are integers where M and K, neither one of them is equal to P or one, if we have an M and K that, we're gonna simply say that M is greater than one and less than P. And another way of saying that is that two is less than or equal to M, which is less than or equal to P minus one. And then similarly for k, 1 is less than k, which is less than p, otherwise known as 2 is greater than or is less than or equal to k, which is less than or equal to p minus 1. All right, so the idea is, is that we are solving this expression, making sure that we stick with integers. Another way of looking at it is p is equal to m times k plus r, where r is equal to zero. And so we're trying to solve for m and k such that they're not equal to one or p, but r is equal to zero. That solution, every time we evaluate one of those, try and figure out if there is an m and a k, it's taking time. Now, which values do we check? Well, the first thing, you know, we could have a starting point here. We could simply go through all the values of k and see, is k, does k divide p? For, let's say, let's just go ahead and use these values. So 2 less than or equal to k less than or equal to p minus 1. All right. And how many evaluations is that going to take? Well, it's going to take uh, from 2 up to p minus 1, which is p minus 2 evaluations. There are p minus 2 times when we try and solve this expression for a certain value of k. Now it turns out that there is a better option. And that better option is that we really don't need to go all the way up to p minus 1. Think about it this way. If p is equal to m times k, then either uh, m is less than or equal to the square root of p, or k is less than or equal to the square root of p. One of those is true. And if we are going through and evaluating integers as we're going on up, what's going to happen is we are either going to encounter m first, or we're going to encounter k first, or if they're equal, we're going to encounter them as p, as the square root of p at the same time. And so now what we need to do is simply evaluate from 2 less than or equal to k, less than or equal to the square root of p. And so we've cut this in significantly. We've cut down this evaluation time significantly. Turns out there's one other way to do this. And this is all based on that property that we talked about earlier. So remember, if 
a divides b and b divides c, then a divides c, right? Now, how does this help reduce the number of evaluations that we're going to have to go through? Well, what it means is, is that, for example, if A is 2, well, 2 goes into any even number, right? Which means we don't have to evaluate all the even numbers to see if they go into C. All we have to do is evaluate 2, right? If A is 5 and 5 goes into B, then 5 also goes into C which means that if we evaluate five, find out it is not a factor of P, we don't have to evaluate 10, 15, 20, 25, anything that's a multiple of A. And that means that our sequence to evaluate is simply prime numbers less than the square root of p. And that significantly reduces how much we have to evaluate to see if a number is prime. So let's have a little fun here. Is p divisible by 2? Can we come up with a rule? Can we come up with something where we just look at the number? And really, this is not as much about computing as it just is about mathematical theory. So can, we, can you come up with a rule that asks, is P divisible by 2? Well, yeah, actually, all you have to do is look at, and what I'm going to say is that we've got these numbers. And, and in fact, um, I'm going to use an example. I'm going to come up with this 314. 159. This is, in fact, a prime number. So it is not divisible by anything at all except 1 and 314,159. And so I'm going to use this. And what I'm going to do is every time I want to see if something is divisible by it, I'm going to multiply it by that. So we know that the only thing that is that that resulting number is divisible by is the number I multiplied it by and this prime number. So I've got 314159 times 2. And that is equal to, and this, this guy, well, it's prime, so it's clearly not, it's not divisible by 2. It is equal to 628318. All right. Now, how do we know that that's divisible by 2? All you got to do is look at this last digit here, right? That last digit right here, it, if it is even, we know that it, P is divisible by 2. So, if P ends in 0, 2, 4, 6, or 8, then 2 divides P. Now, this ends in, I'm going to use another word for this. This digit right here, there's a special word that especially those of us in computing use a lot when we talk about binary. This is the least significant digit. All right. Now, the least significant digit always represents what? It represents the ones place, okay? So what we're looking at is the ones place equal to one, zero, two, four, six, or eight. Is it even? Then two divides P. So remember, we're sticking to just the prime numbers. And so the next prime number after two, that's three. So does three divide P? That's my next question. Now, unfortunately, since 10 is not divisible by three, we can't just look at the ones place and say, yeah, that is clearly, you know, we'll just look at the ones place and know that that's, a, and that that's a particular number divisible by three. But there are tricks. And the way it looks, and the way this trick works is you sum all digits, and I'm talking about the individual digits. So it'd be three plus one plus four plus one plus five plus nine. And so you'd get three plus one, that'd be four, plus four is eight, plus one is nine, plus five is 14, plus nine is 23. That's how you do that. So sum all digits of P, and if result is divisible by 3, then 3 divides P. And I'm going to say this over and over again, repeat if necessary.
Now, let's take a look at this. What's 314, 159 times 3? Well, that's equal to 942, 477. And so what I'm asking for right here is what is 9 plus 4 plus 2 plus 4 plus 7 plus 7? Well, 9 plus 4, 13, 14, 15, 19, 26, and then uh, 26 plus 7 is 33. And 33 is divisible by 3, so we know that this number right here is divisible by 3. Now, if 33, if you don't recognize that 33 is divisible by 3, then you can just apply this again, this repeat if necessary. So what's 3 plus 3? Well, 3 plus 3 is equal to 6, and guess what? 6 is divisible by 3. You can, if you can keep doing that until you get down to a single digit, and that single digit is 3 and 6 or 9, you know you've got a number that's divisible by 3. The next prime number, well, 4 is 2 times 2, so 4 is not a prime number, but 5 is. So, does 5 divide P? That's my question. Well, how do you know if something is divisible by 5? Well, remember, now 10 is divisible by 5. So what you're going to get is this really interesting thing going uh, where when you go 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30, 35, 40, and basically what you're looking at is the least significant digit 0 or 5. If it is, then, so if so, 5 divides P. All right. So let's take this number. We've got 314159. Multiply that times 5. We've got 1570795. Oh, Look at that least significant digit. That least significant digit is a 5. Hence, three, one, the, this number right here, this 1,570,795, that is divisible by 5. What's the next one? Well, 6 is 2 times 3, so we don't have to worry about that. That's not a prime number. Next prime number is 7. So, does 7 divide P? This one is where things start getting a little complicated. And in fact, we're going to show you a little trick for figuring out this uh, algorithm that I'm going to apply. But basically, what you're going to do is a multi-step process. Step 1 remove, and I'm going to abbreviate this here, the least significant digit from P, then multiply that digit by 2. <laughs> this, is, this, this seems a little weird, all right? Now, so what you're doing is you're taking that least significant digit and multiplying that digit by 2. And, and the number that you, so the number that we're looking for, P, is going to have one fewer digits. It's going to lose that ones place digit. Now, subtract the result from step one from remaining digits. All right, and we'll do an example of this so it may not be so confusing. And step three is if result of two is divisible by seven, then seven divides P. Wow. Let's try and do an example here. What's 314, 159? 314, 159 times 7, that's equal to 2199113. All right. So, what we're saying is we're going to take this least significant digit, we're going to multiply it by 2, that becomes 6. And so, we're going to take 219911 minus 6. All right. So, this is that 2 times 3 is where we get this 6 from. That is equal to 219905, right? I hope I did my math right there. Now, I have no idea if that's divisible by 7. So let's apply this again. Let's take this 5. 5 times 2 is 10. And what we're going to do is take the 21990, the digits that are left, and subtract 10. That should be 21980. 
Still have no idea whether that one is divisible by 7. So let's do the same thing. Take the least significant digit, that's 0, multiply it by 2. 2 times 0 is still 0. So we get 2198 minus 0 is equal to 2198. Let's try this one more time. Take the 8. Because I don't know if 2198 is equal to uh, is divisible by 7. So we've got 219 minus 2 times 8, which is 16. That gives us 203. I don't want to run out of board here. And then we take the 3. So we have 20 minus 2 times 3, which is 6. That's going to give us 14. Yes. 14 is divisible by 7, so we know that, that 2,199,113 is also divisible by 7. But in case you don't, we'll take the least significant digit, and we'll take 1 minus 2 times 4, which is 8, and that's equal to negative 7. Negative 7 is, in fact, divisible by 7. All right, next, let's see, we did seven, so eight is two times two times two, so that's not prime. Nine is three times three, that's not prime. 10 is two times five, that's not prime. 11, so does 11 divide P? This one also has one of those odd things going on about it. So starting, this, is, this, one, is, this one is a little different, but I'll show you a way to figure these things out in a minute. Starting with the most significant digit. So we're talking about starting on the left-hand side. Combine the digits by first, by adding first digit, subtracting second, adding third, and so on, right? So just and so on. If result is zero or a multiple of 11, then 11 divides P, all right? So we're going to take this number again. We've got 314159. We're going to multiply this times 11. And what that's going to give us is 3, what is this? 3,455,749. And so what we're going to do is plus 3, minus 4, plus 5, minus 5, plus 7, minus 4, plus 9. So we've got 3 minus 4, it's negative 1, plus 5 minus 5 stays negative 1, then plus 7 is 6, minus 4 is 2, plus 9 is 11. And so we see that this number is also divisible by 11. Next one. 13. Does 13 divide P? 12, we don't need to worry about. 12 is very not prime, right? 12 is divisible by 2, 3, 4, 6, right? So for 13, we're going to do something very similar to what we did for 7. So step one, we're going to remove least significant digit from P and multiply it by 4. This time we're going to multiply by 4. Uh, I can't remember what we did 7, right? 2. Then step 2, we are going to add this time. Instead of subtracting, we're going to add result of step 1 to remaining digits of P. If result of 2 is divisible, divisible by 13, then P, then 13 divides P, right? Repeat 
if necessary. So let's go ahead and try this with our prime number times 13 this time. So what we've got is 314159 times 13, which is going to give us 408607. So we're going to take this least significant digit, the 7, and we're going to subtract 4 times 7 from the 408406. So we've got, or excuse me, add 4 times 7 to 408406. So 408406 plus 28, that's 4 times 7, that's going to give us what? Uh, 408434? Is that right? Now, I have no idea if that's divisible by 13, so we do this again. We take the 4 and we take 40843, and we're going to add 4 times 4, which is 16, and that should give us 408 and then 59. Now we'll take this 9, because I still don't know if that's divisible by 13, and we'll get 4085 plus 4 times 9, which is 36, right? And what we get is 4121. Okay. Now, come up here. We've got 4121. We're going to take this least significant digit. We'll do 412 plus 4, which is 4 times 1. And we get 4, and that's equal to 416. And still don't know if that's divisible by 13. So we take 41 plus 6 times 4, which is 24. And this will give us 65. And then we'll take 65, we'll do 6 plus 5 times 4, which is 20, and that gives us 26. And yes, in fact, 2 times 13 is 26, so we made it, all right? This is going a long way, isn't it? I'm almost done. Divisible by 17. How do we know if something is divisible by 17? Well, there's a similar process. It's just going to change these constants around just a little bit. So, divisible by 16, excuse me, 17. So 13, 14 is not prime, 15 is not prime, 16 is not prime, 17 is the next prime number. And so what we're going to do is, once again, step one, remove least significant digit from P and multiply we're going to have a different value here, where this time we're going to multiply by negative 5. So notice, I think this is the first time we got a negative 5. Well, actually, with the 7, we were subtracting 2, weren't we? So that one was also a negative. Um, but we've got this negative 5 here. Then step 2, uh, we're going to add result from step 1 to remaining digits of P, and then step three, if the result from step two is divisible by, well, we got 17 now, 17, then 17 divides into P. Well, let's try this again with our little example up here. 314, 159 times 17 is equal to 5340703. All right, so 5,304,703. So we take this last digit here. We're going to multiply it by negative 5 this time. So what we're going to get is 53, and that should look a little bit more like a 5, 534070 minus 15. And this is going to give us 534055. Take this 5, again, the 5, and so we'll take 53405 and subtract uh, five negative 5 times 5, so subtract 25, and this is going to give us 53380. Uh, so, so this time what we're looking at is we're going to take the 0, 5338 minus 5 times uh, 0 is equal to 0, so we have 5338. So now we're going to do this again. Take the 8, multiply that by negative 5. And so we have 5, 3, 3, plus negative 5 times 8, that's minus 40, right? And that's going to give us 
Um, what is it? 533, so this should be 493. And now we're going to take the 3, multiply it by negative 5, and add it to 49. So 49 minus 15 is equal to, what do we have here? Um, that's going to be 34, right? All right. And we know actually 34 is equal to 2 times 17, so we should pretty much be done. But we can do this one more time. And so we can take 3 minus 20, and that's equal to negative 17, which is definitely divisible by 17. Now, this idea of coming up with a process to figure out if a prime, if a number is prime or not, is all based on our old friend n is equal to q times m plus r. Now, the proof, or how we're going to derive this process from this, is a little bit much for this lesson, but I am going to show you the steps that it takes to come up with those constants so that we can figure out whether a number is prime or not. And really, what we're looking at is if n divides into p, okay, this prime number p, then n will also divide into, and I'm going to give you a little bit of an expression here. Don't worry about it. I'm going to explain it, and there's going to be two forms of this. One, the expression that we would write in a mathematical formula. The other, how we would enter it into, enter it into a computer. Now, first, the math formula. For, so, first of all, what we're looking at is if n is divide, if n divides p, n divides p, n also divides this little formula here, and we're looking at the floor of p divided by 10 um, and this, and so these weird little back, the L and the backwards L shape, those guys identify something referred to as the floor. Now that sounds complicated, right? But really all it is, is truncating P after we get rid of the least significant digit. So imagine that we divide this guy by 10. What happens is the decimal point moves over to here, just before, just in, to the left of the nine. And when you say floor, you get rid of everything that is to the right of the decimal point. Another way of looking at this is an idea of truncating, getting rid of anything that is in the decimal portion of a real number. So when you take P and you divide it by 10, you're moving the decimal point over so that you're left with one fewer digits. When you take the floor, it gets rid of that portion to the right of the decimal point. And then plus, and this is all we were doing before, some constant c times p mod 10. All right. And so if n is divi if n divides p, n also defines this divides this def divides this weird little expression here. That seems really complicated. It seems like a really complicated expression, but all p mod 10 is, is the ones place. This is just a way of formally writing down the steps that I was writing before. So you would take p mod 10, in this case it would be 9, you multiply it by some constant, and remember we did, what, negative 5 once and 2 once and so forth, and add it to the digits that are left over, that floor. Now, in a computer, this would be written as floor, and now floor is what we're going to call a function, but it's a set of words that inside the print that operates on information inside the parentheses. And, and depending on the programming language, you may see things other than floor written there. But what you're looking at is floor of p divided by 10 plus our constant times p percent sign 10. And if you remember the percent sign from the last lesson, the percent sign simply is the modulo function. So you're doing p mod 10. All right. So all we need to do, I mean, since we've got this expression, everything is known as in this expression. The number that we're trying to figure out if it's prime or not, uh, 10, right? The operations floor, mod, and multiplication. The only thing we're missing here is c. So how do we figure out c? The steps to figuring out C are a little weird. So let's go ahead and do those now. What we're going to do first is we are going to find some value X such that X is the smallest multiple, get rid of some of this, of P that ends in either 1 or 9. So, oh, 
I'll do the example and you'll see what I'm talking about in a minute. So remove last digit, basically the one or nine from X. And I'm just gonna call this X prime, all right? To get X prime. Now, so these are all steps, I guess. If last digit, the digit that was removed was one, then C just equals negative X prime. So whatever we got after we removed the last digit, C is equal to the negative of that. If the last digit was nine, then C is equal to X prime plus one. Now let's do this for 19, because what we're going to do for our last step of the day is to figure out whether to do the process for 19. So the lowest multiple of 19 that ends in a 1 or a 9 is 1 times 19, which is equal to 19. That was pretty easy. So our our x is equal to 19. Now, the next step is to figure out x prime. x prime is equal to 1. We chopped off the 9, we're left with 1. Now, since x, since x itself ended in 9, then our c is just going to be equal to uh, x prime plus 1, which is equal to 2. Now, let's see if this worked. So the process, remember, went something like this. Step one, remove least significant digit of P and multiply by this constant C. So we're gonna multiply by two. Add result from one to remaining digits of P. If result of two is divisible by 19, then 19 divides P. And remember, repeat if needed. So, let's go ahead and do this. What do we have? We have 314159 times 19. Remember, that's our prime number, and that's equal to 5969021. Now, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take this one, I'm gonna multiply it by the two, right? And so what we're going to get is 596902 plus 2. And that's going to give us 596904, right? Take the 4. And now we're going to take 59, excuse me, 59690. So 59690 plus 2 times 4, which is 8. And that's going to give us 59698. Take the 8. 5969 plus 16. This is equal to 5985, right? Take that 5, and what we're going to do is we're going to take 598 plus 10, and that's going to give us what? 608. That's equal to 608. And then take 60, add it to 16, which is two times eight. That's gonna give us 76. And then we'll take the six and we'll take seven plus two times six, which is 12. And that gives us 19. Guess what? That is divisible by 19. Well, once again, my lessons are getting longer and longer. Sorry about that. But the goal is here is to show you all the different ways that we can figure out prime numbers and being able to determine whether something is divisible by a value or not. And this will all help us in our computing applications.